Tuesday morning, December the, uh, what is today? 11th. The 11th. And we're just a few days from my colonoscopy. <laughs> <laughs> we were just talking about this, weren't we? Uh, yeah, what are you going to do? Is that going to be the <laughs> name of your memoirs? My colonoscopy. My colonoscopy. <laughs> By Bill Keeler. Actually, it'll be uh, like <laughs> five repetitive blogs that I do, uh, all associated with the colonoscopy on <laughs> Sunday evening. Is what I'll be doing. <laughs> it's funny because I was actually thinking that a, uh, a former... Uh, a soon-to-be former political representative could write a same book called My Colonoscopy by Bill Keeler. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I've done my best to kind of stay off that topic. Um, <clears throat> who knows? Maybe she'll show up for a Christmas Eve show, which, by the way, is happening on Christmas Eve, 6 a.m. until 12 noon. Lots to get into. Um, a lot of Trump talk. Um, for the first time, you're seeing Republicans begin to... Uh, uh, at the very least, become uneasy with the Mueller investigation. Yeah. Uh, additionally, there were some 40 former U.S. senators that wrote an op-ed to the Washington Post uh, urging the current Senate to think of America and not politics with the impending investigation. I thought that was pretty big, considering of the 40 or 31, how many uh, other, how many there were, um, I believe 11, 10 or 11 were Republicans. So uh, it is an interesting bit of a turn. Um, and we'll talk about that uh, coming up. Peter Franklin, the Gabby Cabby is on in a little while. This morning, uh, defense attorney Frank Policelli is in. He's got a couple of cases he wants to get into. You know, he was extremely involved in at least one very big uh, case with the, uh, with the, with the church. Um, involving pedophilia, uh, very much involved, and has a lot to talk about with that, and believes that maybe there are some things that the Catholic Church has not revealed after all. Also, the Supreme Court last week had uh, an issue, and it was interesting to see liberals and Democrats on the same side uh, of this double jeopardy issue, and he'll explain. Uh, with it. So double jeopardy is uh, that you cannot be uh, charged for the same crime twice. But where and this kind of ties into the to the Trump situation. But what will happen, though, is the state will charge you and then the feds will come in and it might even divvy up the charges just a little bit. So is that double jeopardy? Yeah, you're being you're being prosecuted for the for the very same crime. But they're saying because each state is sovereign, that it is not a violation of the Constitution. And that was an amendment that was uh, that was passed I don't know, back in 1969. So um, I, I feel that's unconstitutional. Technically, it isn't because of an amendment in 1969. But you had uh, Ginsburg, uh, I believe Gorsuch, um, uh, Thomas, all coming out. I believe I have that right. All coming out uh, saying that this is something that the intent, the founders did not intend originally and that we should get rid of this uh this amendment, which allows for, ultimately, double jeopardy. It's kind of a complex issue. He'll lay it out there in layman's terms. You know Frank Policelli. Yeah, in theory, could someone get 50 cracks at a president then? Right, with 50 states. You're talking about different sovereignty. Hmm, and, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, but it's interesting. Technically, they're not, it's not at the president. It's at uh, it's what they're doing with, um, with Cohen and what they're doing with ultimately. Uh, however, you have a lot of uh, Democrats now coming out and saying instead of impeachment, they are talking indictment. So I guess that's all possible. Question for uh, Policelli. We'll get into it. We have a free money question next hour as well. It's worth $100 in cash and a lot of news to get into here today. Uh, tragically, this, uh, this snowmobile stuff, three accidents, they all seem to be um, imprudent speed on difficult uh, trail conditions. Yeah, right? I think maybe a lot of it has to do with this kind of hanging around the 30, 32 temperature range. You know, you've got a. Well, oh, then it's up the to 40. Switching, and then, yeah, yeah. The switching of melting snow and then rain and then freezing rain. And then, you know, we'll, we'll talk with the sheriff later on just to kind of get a reminder of, of uh, the safety protocols. But even, you know, Joe Light, as he's calling himself now, was saying yesterday, um, you know, this that's too much. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for three, a whole season, three let alone is a weekend. Too much. Uh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. All early on in the weekend, and I would imagine it's very much similar to what happens whenever the the first snow falls on the highways, uh, right? Right. Uh, people have kind of forgotten 
uh, how to how to drive and negotiate in the uh, in the winter conditions. But in this case, a lot of the, these are mostly kids, right? Yeah. So one was uh, eighteen year old. Uh, I don't have the names here, right? Right in front of yeah. me. But eighteen year old. Uh, oh, we we goodness. had kind of uh, reported on that one yesterday. He was out of Lewis County, and then uh, a few other. One gentleman was from New Jersey. And he must have just, you know, a lot of people yeah. that come up here and they, they take time. So 46-year-old Thomas Hetherington of Middle Essex, New York. I don't know. Uh, and then 23-year-old Jonathan Black. It was some Somerset, New Jersey, and 18-year-old Luke Tyrell of Adams, New York. Oh my uh, so two of them came from, from downstate. And, uh, you know, this is a big area for people to come up here and vacation and snowmobile. But still 18, and, 23, 46, too yeah. young. Yeah. Way too. Um, I was thinking the other day about uh, if you wanted to get rid of stuff around your house, and you've got, you know, you you can certainly take it to charity. Um, you can bring it in it here off. and give it away. You could you could give stuff away. I've I've done that myself. <laughs> the other thing I I found the the sure way of really uh, probably the easiest way of getting rid of stuff you don't want. Put it in an Amazon box and put it out on your front porch. It probably will be gone in the next six or seven hours. Depending you on the neighborhood. Oh, depending, you're saying- <laughs> depending on where you live. An Amazon delivery driver in Oregon was arrested on Sunday for stealing a package off somebody's porch. He was the Amazon delivery driver. And here's what? a police spokesman. It must have been another from another company. So he delivered the Amazon package. And then seeing, ooh, there's something from Apple. And he, and he, and he took it, allegedly. Wow. Here's a police spokesman who says it was surprising considering... The guy's job was to deliver packages, not take them. If you're a thief, if you're looking to commit a theft, it's super easy to go through a neighborhood and just kind of spot them at at different houses. Um, The reason that this one stands out, of course, is because of his job. You know, we expect that someone who's making the deliveries, whatever service it would be, that they would be trustworthy to do that and not actually be taking them back. So, yeah, it was definitely a surprise. This is the uh, the time for those ring apps, right? You You can put a ring doorbell and it has a camera on it. You put it right on your door. Anytime somebody comes, you're alerted. If they walk up to your door, it's motion censored, kind of something. And then you've got the person on tape. Here's another one. Uh, they're calling these people porch pirates. That's the new name for them, porch pirates. Um, Everyone thinks they're so clever, don't and, they? And uh, a guy in Ohio was arrested on Sunday for stealing what he thought might have been. You never know. It's kind of like a. It's it's kind of like a lottery. You never know what you're going to get in these boxes. He ultimately stole dog food, gym shorts, and a kidney transplant urine test kit. Um, That's what he ended up with, (laughs) the moron. Uh, The woman he stole from needs a kidney transplant, and he stole the testing supplies she needs in order to see if a potential donor is a match. Here we go. People skulking around your neighborhood, searching for packages to steal right off your front porch. It's common at this time of year, but stealing from this home was the wrong move. It's more than just Santa watching. This Nest doorbell captured the thief taking boxes right from the porch of this Green Township home. When police shared the images on Facebook, a woman named Emily Kraft made it clear those packages contained something far more important than Christmas gifts and toys. Her comment reads, I need a kidney transplant and this terrible guy stole one of my potential donors' testing supplies. Her cousins, Anna and Toby Norman, say they were waiting for those testing kits. They are hopeful matches for Emily. Um, Yeah. And speaking of delivery, uh, here's a little audio for delivery. That's Taco Bell. Yeah. Um, A pregnant woman in Pennsylvania was rushing to the hospital to give birth last week, but could not make it in time. She was driving herself. She was on her own. She pulled over in a parking lot of a Taco Bell and did it herself with the help of a 911 operator. Apparently, oh my goodness. she only needed one push. Now she says she deserves something. 911 operator told me to find something to tie her cord with, and I had nothing. So I found a ribbon that I had in my car. So she had a shiny silver ribbon tying her cord. I mean, I think that we at least deserve some nachos out of this because okay. that happened. I believe it was. Can a, I can I have some a, extra napkins? I had a baby. That was a customer of the Taco Bell that that assisted oh, her okay, in the. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, and <laughs> can I just say the drive-through though? You know, you talk about people who do their own do their own thing and uh, are really strong people. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. This Every woman... time a bell rings, a woman has a baby, and it 
Taco Bell parking lot. She delivered her own baby. Uh, that is unbelievable. Well, it looks like she had some help, um, which the story, original story said she didn't have any help, but it looks like she did have a little bit of help. Okay. So, um, okay. I believe that's how it sounded, right? Right. There was someone Tying talking a r- about. yellow ribbon around her old umbilical cord. Something like that. Um, and, I just heard that song. So. And um, are we, uh, this story of the woman in Rochester who died of the brain-eating uh, bacteria. I had this yesterday and didn't get to it, but what happened is crazy. It's a, it's, it, they're saying that she, she contracted the bacteria, uh, the brain-eating bacteria, using a neti pot. You know that thing that you, it looks like a little teapot, and then you put purified water, and you put it in one nostril, and it, it goes in and out. It's helped oh. for your sinuses. And some oh, of them, yeah, they have yeah. the newfangled ones where it's like a suction cup, and it does a whole system. Uh, yeah. Well, that's what she was using, and they're saying that that's what caused it. Um, the but brain-eating they- amoeba infection is what it was, and their suspect, they're, they believe it came from the, the neti pot. So your sinuses are clear, but... So is your skull. Cause wow. It it uh, it's not good. Well, I think one of the things too, if I remember correctly from yesterday's story that I saw, was that she was using tap water as opposed to what they re- recommend as the purified water. I don't know if that I, has I any difference. I thought that she used. Uh, I thought that she used purified water with it, but maybe she did use tap water. So maybe that's what caused. Is it. the idea the bacteria was in the water or it was in the device? I, I mean, that's I, a major lawsuit. That yeah. company probably is going to go out of business. Could you imagine a product you use? Well, they, leads to your brain being they're literally. Gonna, they're they're going to have to prove that what caused yeah. it. So was it the water? Was it the the neti pot? Is it negligence? Did, did she not follow the instructions and clean it properly? There'll be a whole thing there. But you're probably right. There probably will be some sort of a, a, a settlement. But this thing attacks the brain, and we have no solution as of this uh, as of this time. And one more to get you thinking about things this morning: a nine-year-old Canadian girl was apparently so. This makes you wonder. She's nine years old. And it, it, it has to make you wonder, what kind of a spoiled child did these people bring up? So this nine-year-old Canadian girl was apparently so mad at her parents because they were making her clean her room, she called 911. According to police in Ontario, it happened on Saturday. When they arrived, they discovered there was no emergency. The incident prompted authorities to issue a reminder to parents and guardians to tell their children 911 calls should be only made in emergency circumstances. If you're nine years old, do you feel that that child should know the difference between right and wrong when it comes to dialing 911? I think so. At yeah. nine, you're nine years old. Yeah. I understand you're, you're still immature. What is it? That's but, like third or fourth grade. Yeah, you should know. Calling 911 because well, you're angry at your parents. Now you say third grade and I'm thinking, but okay. You you, have, by third grade, by you third grade. should darn well know how to You know how to spell. Yeah, no, at I, that point. I, I they, know, uh, but I could understand maybe a child not understanding the weight of calling the police <clears throat> over a okay, well, dirty bedroom. But anyway, so they uh, the punishment for this kid, they beat the crap out of the kid, <laughs> and um, they said, "Don't do it again." Now you understand. You, you third understand. Grader. I do. Okay. Six thirty one. Andrew updates the uh, the news coming up. We'll talk to Peter Franklin, the Gabby Cabby, as well. And just an update, so clarification for the story. This is W H E C out of Rochester. The 69-year-old woman rinsed her sinuses out twice a day with a neti pot. Uh, oh, this is a different story. Sorry. But the, the woman in particular, she was using the neti pot. The CDC recommends only using distilled, sterile, or cooled boiled water, and apparently she was using filtered tap water. Filtered tap water. Mm. So much for those so, filters, right? Yeah. So the CDC that, is saying and, if and you're it, using a neti pot, use you know distilled, kinda, sterile, or water. makes me wonder, water. like, you take a shower with that uh, that water probably water that isn't even filtered i mean at what I, point I do you agree. have a sore or a cut or something uh, i think you got to dig in and find out where did this uh where did this brain eating amoeba come from and is it in somebody's water supply that's pretty scary i would think it really is it lives in the soil so the idea mm. that you have to you, you have these you have to boil the water maybe how does it because it goes into your body where versus it's going know. into your sinus into your brain yeah I, that's crazy i will never even try that now okay, there's that's no over. chance we have just ruined the stock for <laughs> so this is what happens when they have sandwiches down the hallway they have sandwiches in the kitchen down the hallway so we're all digging in that was courtesy yesterday of our uh, friends with 
uh, Oneida County Tourism. Of course, they do the CNY Travel well, Show. These with were us. yesterday sandwiches. Well, you didn't think they came in this morning, oh, did you? I thought they were fresh. Well, they still taste fresh. They do fresh, taste right? fresh. They do. Uh, so the song, um, I still believe that this is some stupid publicity stunt. Oh, yeah, I got to pull this up. That, uh, that some radio station started because they were looking for a really big promotion. And they decided, hey, let's ban, because this is where I think this came from. They banned the song, Baby, It's Cold Outside, because the song is anti-woman or sexist or something. Uh, the idea I- being within the, the, within this Me Too movement is that this woman is trying to come up with a reason or an excuse, or she's giving a reason why she has to go. She can't stay. So I have And this, the guy is the basically saying, yeah. no, no, you can stay. So in other words, let's... This has is a stretch. Has negotiation become illegal now? <laughs> That's because, well said, actually. Does anybody think every, maybe he was concerned that the roads were slippery and the conditions were bad and, you know, it was sub-zero? I'm just going to tell you something. She may have been drinking. I negotiate with my wife every night. Most times I fail. <laughs> trust me. She holds the ticket. Let me sleep in the bed, please. <laughs> every night. I make my attempt at negotiation. Now, I understand most nights that I fail. However, is the art of negotiation become, no, baby, don't leave. Uh, is, is that become sexist? This is such a ridiculous thing, which m- leads me to believe. That it is a some morning radio station that decided, and by the way, quite brilliantly, because they realize how Americans are reacting right now, quite brilliantly, because it's all over the place now. And uh, I think they initially banned the song, saying, we are no longer going to play this song because it is... Meanwhile, Grandma got run over by the reindeer. That's a okay. Do you mm-hmm. remember when that was sung? There was controversy over that, but at least it was a song about... Santa and his reindeer running over Grandma, killing her. Well, we don't know that it was intentional, for the record. Oh, yeah, it was. <laughs> so um, in this song, I mean, it's just ridiculous. So but this, it's a... worked. The, Dean Martin's daughter was on Fox and Friends talking about it yesterday. What was her take? This is stupid. There's an ironic, ironic twist to this whole story. How, how much publicity they got in office. So this is actually, so it's a San Francisco radio station. Now, they originally stopped. It's nonstop Christmas music, you know, as many stations are now. They pulled it originally. They were the ones that I think caused this <clears throat> KOIT in San Francisco. Why wouldn't you just pull it and stay quiet? No, you're going to pull it and tell everybody you're pulling right. it so everybody can go nuts. So you've got this gigantic publicity. So this programmer, big news story. So now, what is it, a week later, programmer Brian Fagula says, after a public vote, more than 7 out of 10 right. listeners wanted, they, they, wanted they allowed, to hear When the, was the last yeah. time radio stations allow the public to vote on what songs they play? He says, even though they realize some lyrics may reflect a different era and a different uh, sensibility than today, they still like to hear the song. Here at uh, WIBX, we will no longer play I Can't Drive 55 because um, that could lead to speeding speeding on the highways. I mean, what are we going to do here? This is totally a publicity stunt. People just sucked right into it. Everybody went nuts. And it's just ridiculous. Now, and again, so this radio station claims to have pulled it because of the Me Too complaints from listeners, which I don't buy for a second. And and why did the original? It was the San Francisco station that pulled it, right? right. Yeah. Because of the Me Too movement. Oh, that's stupid. Yeah. And then so then they got they they held a poll basically. Do you really want? I mean, that's what this <laughs> is saying. Quote again, so they eventually said. So what he's saying is the listeners' reason who wanted to still hear it. They realize now some of the lyrics. These are the people who want to hear the song. Those lyrics aren't bad. Can you imagine? It's like she wants to leave, and he's like, "Oh, baby, please don't go." So. Now what has to happen is Dean Martin would have to say, baby, can I ask you if I could ask you to please not go? Would it be okay if I were to ask you that question? Maybe I'd like to bring in a third party. (laughs) Okay, so here's the quote I'm I'm zoning in on just for a second to make a stupid point, I guess. The quote was, uh, even though the lyrics, quote, may reflect a different era and a different sensibility than today. The only sensibility I see is like what you're saying, a publicity stunt. Yeah, yeah. Try to get something to go viral. This, this song doesn't really even represent a it different era. This song is people to timeless. Vote. I believe if this continues, this will be the end of humanity. Because two, a man and a woman will never, ever make it into the sack ever again. Because you won't be able to ask. 
And she's not going to want to do it. It's, she's not going to be like, hey, you want to, you know. I think it's going to have to be like a behind kind of, uh, what is the two-way, the one-way mirror or whatever, and you got to kind of just uh, make your selections, and then they'll show a picture, and maybe there's a questionnaire you fill out. And I just think this is just the dumbest thing. <laughs> no. But maybe but maybe the most brilliant thing, right? Uh, all of this I publicity. Wish thought of something. All of these clicks. And, oh, by the way, the radio station that banned it, guess what happened? What happened? they got to play it. They're playing it They're again. playing it now. Because, because of seven overwhelming, out of ten listeners yeah, think. overwhelming support for the song now has uh, has rendered their decision uh, positive for the song. So they're bringing it back. Give me a break. Turkey and American cheese, very delicious. Great way to start your day, I think, anyway. It was uh, great. Uh, I actually had some roast beef, and that probably makes me a horrible person. I probably offended someone that I've ro- eaten roast beef yeah. so early in the morning. Uh, uh, Peter Franklin, the, uh, the uh, certainly the uh, the PETA people. Peter Franklin, the Gabby Cabby, is in New York City. Good morning, Peter. Good morning, morning. This certainly is not a good month to be a turkey. Uh, I guess it isn't because even you know people hit the turkey for Thanksgiving, but then a lot of people come back at Christmas time and have, have yeah. turkey. Uh, yeah, one of the customs in New York City, not at all companies, but at a lot of companies, is that the boss gives out a turkey for the holidays to the employees. I mean, it's no big deal money-wise, yeah. but it's, you know, it's, nice. it's kind of like a nice gift. Peter, but that doesn't help the turkey population either. Do you feel it's time to ban that song, Baby, It's Cold Outside, because it is so sexist? No. Isn't that the dumbest Listen, thing you've I ever own heard? two sons. <laughs> and a daughter and a wife. Yes. So I have, not to mention, some grandchildren. So I'm an equal opportunity parent. Good I, point. I take them as they come. Uh, how about uh, be, being oversensitive, uh, this world of Car- Car- uh, Christopher Columbus? And there's a, there's a monument in, in Columbus Circle named yeah, after Christopher. Yeah, a pretty Christopher. famous one. Yeah. And uh, there's been a lot of word about we have to take that down. We've got to change the name of the circle. Yeah, well, the city fathers did an end run on that because they just announced that they've managed to give it a, on the National Register of Historic Places, uh, which means nobody's going to rip it down. Mm. You know, you get people who, who come forward who profess to be Native Americans, you know, American Indians, and they claim that he was a bad guy who came here and stole the country. Well, I don't know if he was a bad guy or not, but most of your nice listeners probably know he never came here. Right. I mean, I think the closest he got was Hispaniola, which would be, I guess, today. Is uh, that in the the five boroughs? Uh, no, no, it didn't. Did it. I mean, if he had, I yeah. would have taken him around. Yes, you in would. In the cab, I would have met him. I would have met him at his boat. So it's a silly story. So that kind of been put to rest. The other one is a lot of people don't know this little tidbit, which is why I'm your chief correspondent. Robert E. Lee had a house in Brooklyn, mm. and uh, there's a crazy political legislator there who's trying to convince the army to burn the yeah, burn. Yeah. That's what she wants to do. Not just take it down, but burn it down. Uh, the only thing the Army has done is they've taken, which I think is kind of silly, they've taken the sign off of it <clears> that says it's the former Robert E. Lee home, but they haven't burned it or taken it down. These people get onto these kicks. They want they to have burn a house lives. down? See, if they were busy talk show hosts You're or right. busy cab drivers, You're right. they'd have no time <clears> to spend their wasted lives. Well, they probably took the name off it um, because they didn't want people to know where it was, right? And because they fear they're going to do damage to the house. It's crazy. Well, you can, because first of all, you got to get on the base, which in itself is, is a tough cookie. But he was stationed here. And as a matter of fact, I've read a book about uh, Grant, and I've read a book about uh, Lee, and both of them were two pretty good guys. Yeah, and yeah. actually, we probably wouldn't have a country today if it wasn't for Lee, because he was the guy that told everybody after the Civil War, let's all kiss and make up. And he had a tremendous amount of influence. So to rip down his house because he was a bad guy, he wasn't a bad guy. Well, and I think and Grant had a great deal of respect um, in the way that the war, it was all about bringing the country back together. So, yeah, and, so, yeah. and they, both were, they both went to uh, uh, West Point. And so they were buddies. Yep. But, the, you know, the, I, so anyway, they put the Christopher Columbus thing to rest. We have about seven or eight statues of him around the city. We have a uh, street called Columbus Avenue. So, we, you know, he's doing okay. Uh, the El Chapo trial is still going on in, in New York, right? Yeah, I'm absolutely fascinated with it. I mean, I really am. It's just amazing that this guy could have run such a, an empire. And they're, uh, you know, bragging 
Well, they caught him, and now he's standing trial and all of that. And the latest thing is that at the trial, and it was reported in the newspapers, they showed his submarine. <laughs> Can you imagine? Wow, he had a submarine. a submarine. Wow. And then in mm. the morning, this early this morning, there was an article in the papers about the fact that he actually had trains come wow. from Mexico City, oil tanker cars that were filled with dope and drugs. So, I mean, the guy had the biggest profile on the face of the earth, and it's amazing that they think it's a big deal that they yeah. caught him. I can't imagine how they couldn't have caught him. Well, what I find interesting <laughs> is how they're, is how they're, they're, I mean, they shut down the Brooklyn Bridge to get him there, and, I mean, it's been... Well, and it's not like the drugs stopped. It's not like his yeah. operations yeah. shut down because he's on trial. We have to stop dealing these drugs because our, our kingpin is uh, how, I want trial. I want your take, uh, i got about 90 seconds, your take on this, uh, the NYPD is going to start using drones for surveillance, kind of a big big brother spying on you a little bit from above. Yeah, they're going to do it on New Year's Eve. They're going to start it in Times Square. Mm. Times Square never has any trouble on New Year's Eve. It really doesn't. Maybe they'll arrest one person or something. It's a horrible experience, by the way. I'm not saying people shouldn't do it, but Times Square in itself, there's no place to make a pee. The guy standing next to you had a garlic pizza. You know, so it's a real chore. <laughs> and now you're going to have drones <laughs> flying over your head. You know, checking you out. So I don't I'd know like how. Just I, but know that uh, we are running a special promotion now. You can get the Gabby Cabby steel helmet okay. to wear in Times Square. It'll prevent the drone. If one of these from, drones yeah. come down, you know, like you'll it. be safe. That might be worth something. That might be a real concept. You got to patent that. So uh, I'm working on it. All right, Peter Franklin. Great stuff. Best tour in New York City. If you're heading down for the holidays, uh, give him a call. Reach out to him via email. Go to his website at gabby.com. For details, and Peter, thanks so much. We'll do it again next week. You got it, sweetheart. Right, thanks so much. You, Peter Franklin, the Gabby Cabby. You always talk about that little room you have, and, and maybe some people have a man cave. This guy's got a submarine. He's got a submarine <laughs> and train cars. Crazy. Defense attorney, Frank Puticelli. Frank, good morning. Thanks good for morning. coming in. Thank you. Uh, you have There are a couple of cases. Before we get into the Catholic Church, which I, I do want to get into, and you have a lot of knowledge on, and I want your take on all of this. Um, can you just, in a nutshell, in layman's terms, put together this uh, this debate the Supreme Court has had over what is essentially, I believe, double jeopardy? Yeah, exactly. Well, here's here's what happened last Thursday. There was an oral argument heard on a case that came out of Alabama called Gamble. That was because a year earlier, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Clarence Thomas. Two well, unlikely allies. Well, it depends on the <clears throat> issues. That's why yeah. the judiciary is independent, okay? Yeah. Decided that the so-called separate sovereign exception to the double jeopardy clause of the Fifth Amendment should be reexamined and that uh, they should overrule that and that there should be no exception to the double jeopardy clause of the Fifth Amendment. So essentially what uh, what they're they're saying is – if the if the state goes after you, the federal government can't on the, the same crime, even if they divvy up the charges, because that's what they try to do, right? Or vice versa. What they're saying is that the separate sovereign document um, doctrine, which means the states are sovereign from the union, they're individual. Yeah, the states are sovereign. The, the, the you know, states remain sovereign under yeah. the Tenth Amendment, but then there's a whole bunch of of discussion as to what kind of sovereignty are we talking about. Right, okay, right. so that's one issue. There's several <clears> issues. <throat> I got all the the briefs that were filed with the Supreme Court and the oral arguments and all that. And and what it comes down to is whether or not the rule of separate sovereign has been eviscerated and has no longer any purpose. Now you talk about stare decisis and overcoming stare decisis and she's calling for that in her opinion, and, and, the, and the ironic thing is this. Here's, here's what it boils down to. Yeah. The legal question, I'll try to make this as, as understandable as possible. Okay. okay. I'm sure you'll go over our heads. but uh, No, I won't. Okay. No, that's the name of the game, right? right. That's the art. Back in 1959, there was a case that went to the Supreme Court arguing against a separate sovereign called Barkas versus Illinois. And they says, well, you know, the, the Fifth Amendment doesn't apply to the states as a matter of constitutional law. It's not incorporated. So the Fifth Amendment of double jeopardy only applies to federal prosecutions, and the states are still sovereign. So it doesn't apply. That was 1959. Mm -hmm. Justice mm -hmm. Black wrote a dissenting opinion. Justice Ginsburg, Ginsburg cites and quotes his dissenting opinion 
in her concurring opinion in the case from last year the, yeah. uh, with Puerto Rico, okay? But what because what happened in the meantime, in 1969, the Supreme Court says, as a matter of due process under the 14th Amendment, we incorporate the Fifth Amendment Double Jeopardy Clause to apply to the states. Incorporation changed the game. Okay. So she cites all the articles and all the criticisms on it and all the pr- problems and complications that arise and the fairness and all that so that they now revisit that issue. Now, it doesn't apply – it doesn't – if somebody's prosecuted in federal court, they can't prosecute them again in New York State because New York State has a statute prohibiting right. that, Got as it. does 19 other states, okay? Mm-hmm. But there's nothing stopping the federal government from prosecuting somebody in federal court if for they've the been ver- prosecuted if for they, the very same crime that they were prosecuted in for the state. in state uh, court. So if it's reversed, um, they can. So what I, I find this all stems back. So why do we have this? So it stems back to the mafia. It stems back to uh, uh, cases, uh, civil rights cases. Right. Funny Which you is, should mention the civil rights cases. Yeah. Back in the 50s and 60s, when the civil rights movement was coming into focus, and you would prosecute these people down south for these uh, crimes and they would be acquitted, you had civil rights violations that were enacted that you could prosecute them for in federal court. Justice Black, I don't know if you know the history of Justice Black. No. He was from Alabama, and it is rumored to have been a member of the KKK. So he wrote the most eloquent uh, dissents for personal liberty uh, in, in, the, in, the, in, in the case, the Illinois case, mm-hmm. the Black, Blackridge case or yeah. whatever it was, okay? On the other side of the coin, you have this kid Gamble who stopped in a car. He's got guns and drugs and he's African-American. He gets prosecuted in state court and the feds say, we're going to prosecute him right. again. So you have strange alliances, yeah. So what yeah. do you do? Well, you, you look to the original text and you find out what it means. This, you... is the, this is a perfect example of the slippery slope. So when you're thinking about a, uh, a black man that was hung and, uh, from a tree in the south and they found the two guys that allegedly did it and this white jury in a, in a racist community found him not guilty. So when you, when you bring this up, to have the feds come in and, and go after him again and convict these two guys... You feel good about that. Where the slippery slope comes into play is you can also use that in so many other instances, which might not feel so good. Well, that brings us to the Pettit policy, that the government and and an internal policy of the United States Attorney's Department of Justice that says we will use our discretion and decide who do we want to prosecute separately and and, and consecutively. However, in this day and age, and this is the argument that they made in the Supreme Court, in this day and age, where you've got federal and state coordinating investigations all the time. There's so many federal crimes. There's no need to have successive prosecutions because you could all get together and have one prosecution, whether it be in state right. court or federal. <clears throat> right, right. Um, what happens out of this, though? What, what do you feel will, will come out of the court? I, I Well, if Will you, they overturn the 1969? Who, who knows? Yeah. I mean, I, I think here's what you got. I think you could make the argument that you got Ginsburg and Thomas, and from the oral argument, maybe Gorsuch. Mm-hmm. Okay, now do you get Kavanaugh? I don't think you're ever going to get Alito. Okay? You just brought up. You just brought up Kavanaugh. So you realize we spent a month arguing over Kavanaugh and the fact that he was going to stomp on a woman's right to to choose uh, on Roe v. Wade. If you notice, there was a decision yesterday not to hear a case that landed in favor of the the uh, in favor of Planned Parenthood. And uh, did you see which which justice was was the one to put him over the top? It was Kavanaugh who voted. Uh, his his vote was to not see the hear the case, which was in favor of Planned Parenthood. I thought that was quite interesting. Well, I I, I guess my cynicism would say. He didn't want. He didn't have to decide the issue. He avoided. Okay, so maybe, he he did, maybe he didn't want the case yeah, because yeah, there's that's, too that's much you, publicity. Well, that's that's the Supreme yeah. Court policy. We're not going to decide an issue unless we absolutely have to. Right. And that's why she was so. Ad, uh, Justice Ginsburg was so concise and precise in saying, "Look, we need to reexamine this." Now, who knows what's going to happen between now and June? Right. Right. What kind of inner workings are going to be made? 
and and how they decide cases. Mm-hmm. It's going to be very interesting. Um, did you did did you support uh, Kavanaugh? I what do you mean support him? Well, did you believe that he should have uh, that he should have been the nominee? I think he was treated unfairly. Yeah. Oh, he certainly was. Um, you know, um, I don't know what kind of a judge he was. I know he was been a judge for like 20 years in the federal yeah, system. Yeah. He's been in Washington, D.C., and, and it's kind of hard for me to believe nobody knew about his past after he was living right. and practicing law for 20 years yeah, in D.C. Pretty, D. C., pretty you know. crazy. Manaski had an interesting take on what could, you know, if they, if, if they're charged, if they, if they made a charge against the president, could 50 other states, um, is that your, how did you well, word that? Well, I guess it'd be. It's the slippery slope thing. It's like, if yeah. you can do it here, okay, so what if New York is unsuccessful? I know you talked about different states have different statutes, but what would stop then from Massachusetts or then Delaware, then no Florida, contact. then Texas? They'd have to have contact. But then this is why I looked at the states that, that have the same statutes like New York to see, well, I'm pretty sure no, you know, South Dakota can't touch him. I'm pretty right. sure, you know. Right. So, so what, what about <laughs> Delaware? Okay, right. Delaware's got a statute. What about Virginia? Virginia's got a statute. What about Massachusetts? What about Connecticut? I mean, who cares about these other states right. Right. If, I'm, if I'm looking yeah. at it from his point of view? So can I just ask one thing? This isn't, I think, so much to the point of what we're talking about, but we were talking about double jeopardy. Can you clarify something? You can't be charged again for the same action the same criminal quote That's, criminal act okay. or you can't I'm face the you. same charge because uh, let, let me just give an example for listening i know i know you know where i'm going say i'm charged with let's say second degree murder and i get off can they come back with first degree murder or can they come back with criminally negligent homicide is no, it the same no, act they no, can't recharge no, no, or the same actual charge in the amicus brief that was submitted in this case to the supreme court there's a whole discussion on what do we mean by same offense? Because that's the language of the double jeopardy clause. Justice Ginsburg uses the word misconduct. Which could mean a lot. Yeah. It's pretty broad. Um, but it means well, that would well, mean well, the act, not well, the charge. Yeah. Okay, what if the charge is conspiracy? Okay, that takes two years. Now, I'm the federal government. I'm investigating this guy on a conspiracy charge. I know I could torture him by piecemealing these charges one by one in state court. And then I still got him. I wear him down. Well, what does Ginsburg say? She says, you know, this is the purpose of the double jeopardy clause to prohibit that kind of harassment and ordeal. Okay. Now let's suppose somebody gets indicted and convicted of a federal RICO charge. They get 40 years in prison, but they omit a, a murder that was committed as part of the enterprise. Okay. Could the state come back and charge them with that? Or are they barred by the statute? See what I'm yeah. saying? There's yeah, there's a whole bunch of – and that's the pettit policy, which they address in great detail of how that is an arbitrary and doesn't – it just doesn't work. Now, in layman's terms, the difference would be a serial killer. If he kills one person and then kills another, you don't take the serial killing uh, as a whole. Each individual murder could – could bring a murder charge. Well, it depends on where the murders take place. Mm. Oh, really? So if they all t- took place in, let's say, New York, would you not be able to have more than one murder charge if the oh, person sure. killed? Yeah. yeah well, sure. So, and that's, that's not kind double of the jeopardy, difference, right? Because that's, 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 these are you're being charged with separate, each individual yeah, crime. Separate crimes. Yeah, yeah. And that brings us to, well, the, the rule up until now, who knows what the rule is going to be, was called the Blockburger test where if there was an element of one crime that was in one jurisdiction that's not an element of a crime in another jurisdiction, it's not double jeopardy. Mm. <clears throat> so you have the Blockburger exception. But now what what depends on the crimes and the elements of the crimes and, and the so, conduct and the transaction? An obvious question, though. Why should people care about this? Because it is a bit over my head. Um, but at the same time, it's extremely interesting and it's extremely important. Well, in the in the lawyering business, it's important yeah. to know what the Constitution says. Well, in the suspect business, it is too. I think so. You're charged. It's uh, it, it's it's really important. Well, you know, um, in this day and age, defense lawyers are obligated, and the judges give you orders at the beginning of every case as to what your ethical obligations are, mm-hmm. because the law is changing. For example, what are the repercussions of immigration law? 
on a criminal conviction. That, you know, what, that, <clears throat> that becomes a, an area that's important. Who was the, uh, the guy and the kid in uh, Florida um, where they were, the kid was walking in um, Trayvon Martin? Yes. So that's another example because if you recall, that, that guy, what was his name, uh, the, the, the shooter? Uh, he was found Florida not guilty Trump. by a uh, by a Florida court. There was talk about Eric Holder, if I remember, uh, doing some sort of a hate charge, a federal hate charge against him. That, and I don't think that ever happened, but that would have been an example of this. The feds had the right to do that, right? Well, they would have argued that certainly, <clears throat> and, yeah. and, and, I, and you would argue under double jeopardy, and that's that double that would jeopardy. Have been yeah. yeah. Well, take it a step further. Take somebody who's who's convicted in state court of a criminal sexual act and gets twenty something years, then he's convicted of child production, or production mm, of child pornography in right. federal court, and gets another twenty years on top of that. Yeah, how They're is that not dub, 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 I don't, right? You know, saying, not that I have any sympathy on the pedophile, but at the same time, how is that not double, double jeopardy? It totally is because they were two the separate sovereign mm, doctrine. Right, so if the separate right. sovereign document is no longer an exception, you're going to see a few people coming back to court to get their convictions yeah. in federal court vacated. Uh, and that George really Zimmerman. shouldn't, that Zimmerman, yeah, that shouldn't play a role, right? I mean, the, the whether if there's an injustice, we shouldn't worry about all the other people that have, have been victims of that and, and avoid changing the law because of that, well, right? Well, that's, that's another argument that was briefed in this case, wow. and you're not opening up the floodgates of litigation, and if you do, so what if it's a constitutional violation? Yeah. You know, something I haven't heard, you mentioned sex offenders. I know we want to get to the Catholic Church. Yeah, the Catholic bit. Church we're going to get to coming right up here. Uh, the civil confinement in New York State, what's your take on that? Someone who, you know, let's say it's a pedophile and they get 12 years, they go to jail for 12 years, uh, they get out and then they become confined. Is that still the case? Do you have a take on, on whether or not that should be allowed? Right, because you serve your sentence, and then they say, well, <laughs> you're still a danger, and so we're not going to let you out. you yeah. got to stay in this housing yeah, have, unit, I supervised. Haven't, I haven't thought about that issue in years, to be honest with you. I don't, haven't, had, haven't had that really come up. All right, we're going to get to the, uh, the – you have had a lot of dealings when it comes to the, the Catholic Church and this priest issue and, and pedophilia. And was the church absolutely honest with us uh, when they released the report the other day? I, what do you mean? Were they absolutely? Did honest? they disclose everything? I don't know. I didn't read the report. All right. But from what I was told by uh, Julie Mc, McMahon, who's doing the story in the Post Standard, the uh, representative of the Syracuse Diocese said that they didn't realize that Father James Quinn uh, had committed any of these acts until after he died in 2013. And, and we, you're contesting that. Contesting that. Okay, we'll get it's, into it. <laughs> it's, been, it's been in the record in the Court of Appeals. We're, we're going to get into it uh, coming up. Uh, I'll do our free money question before, uh, and that's worth 100 bucks from the Hobica Law Firm. But Frank Policelli is in this morning. We'll talk about the Catholic Church, talk about the disclosure, and talk about some of the cases uh, that you've been in, involved in um, through many years uh, of, of litigation and trying, just in some cases, trying to be able to litigate it, right? Oh, yeah. We went all the way to the Court of Appeals on the Zampano case. We'll talk about it coming up. In studio right now is Frank Policelli. And while the la- the previous half hour was a little bit out of our wheelhouse, and and, uh, and I really think the topic is a bit over over our heads a little bit, but at the same time, this next story is really affects so many people in the area, and it's this Catholic Church scandal. I don't know what else to call it, uh, but the priests. And last uh, week they released the list of priests that they say uh, were credible, involved with some sort of inappropriate sexual behavior. And Frank Policelli, you say the list was not complete. The list of victims or the list of the priests? The list of the priests. I didn't, I didn't pay much attention to it. I looked at it. I know I had some of those priests that I had uh, litigated with over 20 years ago. You had wiretapping, right? Can you talk about that? It wasn't a wiretap. It was a body wire. A this body was 30 wire. years ago. Okay. I had, a, when, when this first, first of all, these, these, child, these priest pedophile cases came up out of Boston. This was maybe 35 years ago, okay? Yep. But then I had somebody come to me back in 1987 who had been victimized by a very prominent Monsignor here, okay? Here in the, in the Utica area? Here in the Utica area. <clears throat> and I said, the only way we're going to be able to prove your case is to get an admission from him on tape. So we had these 
investigators out of New York that were former DEA agents. They, they wired him up. He went, he talked to uh, Monsignor Sewell, and he got Monsignor Sewell on tape admitting that he had had sex with him um, and said that, well, you you went along with it, and the, the, the victim says, I put up with it. Mm. And as a result of that, there was a settlement with the Catholic Church who had this priest that would go around settling all these cases. His name was Father Placa. And um, so he signed a release. So when they had this— So this is a non-disclosure. <clears throat> yeah. 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 And, and he got paid. And then what happened, now, you know, you go back, now you take it 20 years down the road. And that's when we filed all these lawsuits against the uh, Diocese of Syracuse in regards to the sexual abuse. They argued the statute of limitations. We argued that they were equitably stopped from asserting the statute of limitations, and, and we litigated that case to the Court of Appeals in the state of New York. We had over, now this was the Zampano case. And we had overwhelming evidence that Father James Quinn, over a period of years, sexually uh, abused and, and uh, violated John Zampano. Quinn, another name that people will know in the area. Right? Absolutely. He was he the school. head of the CYO back in the 60s. He was a very prominent man. And um, it was open and notorious the relationship he had with John Zampano, who we called Babe because I was there during this period of time at St. Agnes School, mm. as was so many other witnesses to this day. And we made a record, and we got hospital records. We got psychiatric records. We've got uh, evidence of travels of when, of when he would take uh, Zampano, Father Quinn would take Zampano with him to Chile. He would take him with him skiing. He would take, he would stay nights at the rectory. Uh, one morning he, uh, John found uh, the pastor of the church dead on the stairs. Um, Dave D'Alessandro, who was there, saw him coming down. Uh, I mean, the evidence was overwhelming. And he was underage at the time? <clears throat> yeah. He high, was like, high school age? He was uh, CYO like 13. Age, so, yeah. From 13 to, to uh, 18. And, and, and all, the, all of us kids that went to school at St. Agnes, it was so obvious to yeah. us what was going on here. You do, you, know? do you think it would have been different if – now, we're just looking at what's happened in the, uh, in the gymnastics case. Well, that has bankrupted the, the United States gymnastics. Of course, they're, they're filing for bankruptcy because they know what's coming, many lawsuits. But uh, now you've got somebody fired for not saying anything. Do you think it's because the, the, the people perceive things differently with boys than they do girls – that we look at the, the boys and say, well, they can take care of themselves. But if it was a girl, do you think it's different? Is there a double standard there? I, I don't see that. I yeah. don't All right. know. Can I ask you, the story you just told, you said you were in school there, everybody knew yeah. it. I mean, you told your parents, you told other teachers, it was something no, that was our talked parents, about? No, our parents trusted us to travel with Father Quinn with the CYO. We, All over, right? We went to Chicago. We went to New York. We went to Miami. And, and you know, our parents never questioned uh, the, the clergy back in those days. And we would go to these places, and you'd have these, uh, you know, we were like 15, 16-year-old boys staying together in a hotel completely unsupervised, and, and Zampano would stay in the room with Father Quinn. Mm. You know, and it's and it's... It, and you bring up a good point there back then. You, know, you talk about, like, you know, the parents, they never saw anything. I mean, a lot of these people are such, were such, and they are devout Catholics now, but back then were such devout Catholics, they're taught these priests, they're like God's servants. Well, they're, you could be, I mean, a, a, a priest would not I mean, think, at the time, from what I've heard, a parent could be scolded by a priest. Uh, yeah. So if you'd question the church, you'd be scolded. Um, it, you would be... Well, they were. they were certainly the authoritative figure that yeah. everybody bowed down to and yeah. believed in, okay? And, and of course, uh, unfortunately, uh, for, for Zampano, he was a vulnerable victim. What happened? Uh, he him? lived across the street from the rectory. Um, he had three older brothers. Um, his mother was a single parent back in the, you know, in 1963. Well, so you're creating this. Is, you're painting the, mm -hmm. the perfect picture. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And, 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 you know, the, the, the record that we developed in this case, because remember, we litigated this case for four years. Wow. 
we have overwhelming evidence, and this is all part of the record that went to the Court of Appeals. And, the, and when the Post Standard told me that the that the Catholic Church had denied that uh, that they had any knowledge of of Quinn's wrongdoing until 2013, I mean, I just I just laughed. I mean, I wasn't surprised that they would say something like that. Certainly hit home for you, though. But when we argued the case in uh, Supreme Court here in Oneida County. The judge told the lawyers for the Diocese of Syracuse that he felt duty-bound to dismiss it because the law said the statute of limitations warranted that, but that we had a very strong case. So they knew that we did. Uh, Sue is on the line. Uh, Sue in Utica, you're on the radio. Good morning. Good morning. Mr. Pellicelli, recently I saw a report, an Albany report, that they want to change the law where private schools are mandated to report sexual abuse. Is this the case? Are they not mandated to report sexual abuse? And I'll hang up. All right. She's talking about in private schools. <clears throat> well, um, private schools, Boy Scout Club, troops. Well, they got to um, know about it, right? <laughs> you know, and when the principal of the school is the abuser, is he right. going to report it? Yeah. Well, but the, by law, teachers. My wife, uh, a teacher, public school teachers are, re- are required by law to report. I believe doctors, even well, sure. uh, nurses, well, sure. uh, there is a there's a, a mandated report reporting uh, clause. And that doesn't exist for the for, for churches. I, I, it baffles me. So well, the church can be their own judge should. and jury. They, well, yeah, they are. They, yeah. they seem to think that they are. Um, but I don't see um, the legislature enacting any legislation to open up any any windows. And I want you to be frank about this. Why is that? Because it's not, we're all, there's got to be a Catholic lobby, right? I think think that it's not only the Catholic lobby. I think you have other uh, religious organizations that don't want anybody to have the opportunity to sue any of their past uh, clergy members. So for those that are looking and saying, oh, those Catholics, uh, it's not just Catholicism. Oh, no. Yeah, no. Right. No, I mean, it's, it's people, really. Yeah. It's people. I mean, yeah. the bigger the religion, the people bigger organizations finding, people, escape, finding, people finding a safe haven. Exactly. The perfect place to to, to grow to their blend in horrible and desires. Exploit children. Yeah. yeah. Which could be a, any any place where somebody has power over, over kids. Yes. It's terrible. Yeah. And and the devastation that uh, that you believe that caused Impano um, emotionally, um, we didn't finish on what happened to him ultimately. Well, he had severe um, repercussions as a result of that. He was unable to function. Um, he suffered from severe anxiety, post traumatic stress disorder. Um, he was the ultimate victim, and if you look at the, we had uh, the expert from Albany, Dr. Richard Hamill. He passed away, but he evaluated all of these people. He, he was the man yeah. twenty years ago. This was the case. This was the worst case he had ever seen hmm. of the effects of priest pedophile sexual abuse. Because you have to remember that this went on. For a period of time, and, and, and he, Quinn acted like he owned him. Five years. That's his teenage he, years. He'd get yeah, him yeah. drunk. He'd take him places. That was his, you know. Right. That was his date. What happened to him? Zampano, is he still around? No, he did passed he, away. He did pass away. He passed away three years ago. All right. So I, that's the part of this whole story. It's easy to just, we read these stories, and, and but they have personal... They affect people. They ruin this whole and life. And they ruin people. Yeah. They ruined his whole life, yeah. So what what can people do? I mean, obviously we support the church. There's a minority of, of, of priests that are, are deviants. Um, hopefully they've eradicated the, the deviants. Um, what, can, what can people do? There should be a mandated reporter law put into place. Well, yeah, I, I, I don't think that would hurt anything yeah. if they were mandated. I guess but if, so. But I guess what does but that what do? I'm saying right. is that if they're the perpetrators, they're not going to uh, okay. you know, get what you're saying. Right. And at the same time, it's not like just because there's, it's not a mandated law, if you see something, you couldn't but you can't pick go, it up the ladder. But you can't go after the church today. I guess you can. But, but if there was a law, a, a priest who knew it would be criminally 
negligent because of yeah, that. And irresponsible. Yeah. Right. Or if someone that, that was a, even a nun, if someone knew, they'd be a mandated reporter. And if they didn't, they could be charged. Yeah, like an assistant pastor yeah, I, knew I, that I, the I hear pastor what you're was, saying. Yeah. I, I don't think that's going to It's not going to happen. I don't think though, it's workable. So. Yeah, and that is just because the lobby, uh, from all different angles, is is against that. When we were in the eighth grade at St. Agnes, when Quinn started his abuse of Zampano, and Zampano would act out, the the principal of the school was uh, Sister Joan. We contacted her when she was in a nursing home twenty years ago to see if she would be willing to testify about what occurred yeah. on certain occasions when she was present, she was too scared. Wow. She didn't want to get she she was too scared. So you know there are that. there are there there are nuns out there today saying do not report a sexual crime to your church. Report it to the authorities. Well now and that's coming from nuns. Well well now uh, with this uh, it's a different world today, independent reconciliation program yeah. that they that they instituted, they they do have agreements with district attorneys' mm-hmm. offices, including here in Ohio yes, they County. do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I'll, well, you know, uh, Mike Arcuri investigated the uh, Sampano case, and you know, unfortunately, he agreed that uh, because of the statute of limitations, they couldn't go forward with it. Terrible story. Uh, Frank Policelli, we appreciate it. You always come in with something that's impactful, and this one is quite the uh, quite the story, and your involvement is just, uh, it's uh, it's sad, right? The whole thing is just horrible. It is, but, you know, you always fight for the underdog. Yeah. Uh, we appreciate it. Frank Policelli, right, uh, we'll do it always again. Pleasure. Political strategist Debbie Jorgados, uh, who's standing by right now with a little update on the Russia investigation. Uh, Good morning, Debbie. And where do you think we are right now with this? It seems that Republicans are beginning to get a bit uncomfortable. You know, it's very interesting. First of all, good morning and thank you for having me. There certainly are Republicans who are cannot wait to have the Mueller investigation wrap up to find out what is Mueller is actually going to put out there that could either be the basis for an impeachment of Trump or a criminal charge. But I think one of the best things happening in this entire Mueller uh, as Trump calls it, witch hunt, is that Jerome Corsi, who was one target that whom Mueller uh, tried to interview and um, and wanted to force uh, Mueller wanted to force Corsi to sign an admission that he had lied to federal officers. Jerome Corsi has turned around and filed a lawsuit against Mueller. Now, for those that, that he, he is uh, he's the conservative author and, and believed to be tied to WikiLeaks, right? Well, that was the allegation. That's what yeah. gave rise to all of this. Prior to Corsi sitting down with Mueller's team about 10 days ago, or I'm not sure, when, in the last few weeks, Corsi had voluntarily given the Mueller team his email, his computer, his passwords to all his email accounts, his social media accounts, turned it all over. So he's saying an interview with the Mueller team, and they're asking him questions. They've got all the information in front of him. Jerome Corsi does not have all of his emails in front of him. He's just sitting there answering and they asked, did you forward this particular email, which yeah. we can talk about in a second, to uh, anyone? And he said no. And they said, wrong, because we have it right here. You did forward it. So that is the basis for them trying to, for Mueller team to try to argue, of course, he needs to sign something admitting he lied to federal officers. And he won't do it. He said, I didn't lie. I forgot yeah. I forwarded it. When they showed it to me, mm. I corrected that. So, so and, yeah, and here's, a, a, here, here's a question. As a, as a reporter, as an author, Based on our First Amendment rights, um, if you get information, I mean, what part of the law is it the lying that is breaking the law? Is that it? That what the charge they would make against him is, yeah, you don't even have to be under, you don't even have sworn, have to have sworn to be under penalty of perjury to commit a felony. It's a felony right. to lie to a federal officer. Right. So Horsey sitting there saying, no, I didn't forward that when he did. Their argument is you lied to the federal office, yeah. but, they, but the particular link to all of this investigation of Trump was the email in question came from Roger Stone, a Trump operative, to Jerome Corsi saying, can you get in touch with Julian Assange, the WikiLeaks guy who put out all of those Hillary Clinton emails during the campaign? Can you get in touch with him and find out what's in them or find out yeah. what, what's coming next? And Jerome Corsi replied, no, I cannot. I don't have contact with Assange. Mm-hmm. And then Jerome Corsi forwarded that email to another 
player in all of this named Ted Malik, who did nothing with it. But the point is, Mueller was trying to tie Corsi to yeah. Julian Assange, the WikiLeaks leaker. And Corsi said, I've never met him, didn't talk to him, didn't know what was coming. Mm. So, of course, he is really, he's going on the offense. And there are a lot of folks, including myself, cheering this on because Mueller has gotten most of the, of the guilty pleas in this whole process by this perjury trap mode, yeah, yeah. which he was trying to use again on Corsi. If his, uh, listen, we find out when this is all said and done that that Mueller doesn't have any other evidence other than testimony from these people that seem to be pressured. The president says they're being pressured into lying. But just a Cohen, for example, um, how credible is, is his testimony? How do you believe this guy? Uh, Mueller <laughs> certainly better have recordings or emails or something to back other than up. Testimony, yeah, other yeah. than Mueller, other than uh, Cohen's testimony, because this guy's just not credible, right? Yeah, he he is a huge problem. Uh, Cohen, uh, Mueller has to rely on someone. He's, he's calling a liar, but has to rely on him. Yeah. The threats to President Trump, to distill it down, the threats to President Trump that could come out of the Mueller thing, as far as we know, is number one, did he, Trump, authorize the payments by Cohen to these two women that Trump allegedly had some alliance with? And the um, you know the argument is, is that a campaign finance law violation and did trump order it and so that's one thing it's paying off a, a former um lover or yeah so that's one and then the other one that is just um eating away at this um entire investigation uh is is a unbelievably picky argument that trump knew about the trump tower meeting and in answers before it happened and in answers to to Mueller's questions trump said he didn't know about it ahead of time this is so absurd to think you can bring down a sitting president over a whether he knew about a meeting, which was legal. There was yeah. nothing illegal happening at that meeting, nothing illegal alleged yeah. about that meeting. It was just that it was. So the idea they're going to this is where I think that Mueller team is overstepping. They're thinking they're going to sort of stir something up. And I think it's really going to make end up making him look bad because these are these are not serious charges right. to bring down a president. I, however, let's just uh, and I I. Kilmeade yesterday was going on about this, and he's absolutely right. Why not say, yes, there was a meeting. Yes, we were thinking about building this Trump Tower in Russia. Yes, we were doing this. Yes, we did this. Instead, this president has chosen to say, not true, you're a liar, it's fake news. And this drip, drip, drip of the truth keeps coming out when this could have been solved months ago. This is totally horrible. uh, uh, Optics. uh, It's bad optics, but it's just... Not the way you'd expect a president to react. I mean, I, honestly, right? I mean, just <laughs> well, come out and say know, this is it. That put it thing, on, on the one hand, yes, you would like to have a. Um, you, I mean, it's it's a bit of it's a bit of fanciful thinking now to look back and say, well, if only he'd said this, and everything would have been different. Yeah. Because we really don't know that the Mueller team has been after, and, and in fact, there have been brilliant statements about among by some of the most prominent. Illegal minds. I mean, Andrew McCarthy's been talking about it. Alan Dershowitz, basically saying this prosecutor is not looking to find out if a crime occurred. He's creating crimes through his investigation. And so, if you're in that environment, in that mindset, and you're just you you know this guy is out to get you. I think you're a little bit you're just protective. And yeah. you know the idea. Of, I mean, Cohen lying about whether or I guess he did lie about Cohen did about whether or not. The Russia hotel deal fell apart in January versus June of 2016. Even that, in the grand scheme of bringing down a president, I, I just think that the Mueller team is completely out of control, which, getting back to Corsi, is why it's so great yep. Corsi has filed this lawsuit. All right, it's going to be interesting to see what all, and, and hopefully this all comes to a head and this thing ends. But the thought of having it end before the end of the year doesn't seem to be as, uh, as or Trump's presidency promising. Yeah. I don't well, think, I don't it's know. just a big mess. I, I can't wait for it to go. Debbie Jurgados, thank you so much for taking the time. Great talking with both of you. Thank right. you. Thanks. The annual Keeler in the Morning, WIBX Christmas Eve extravaganza happens Monday, December 24th, Christmas Eve morning from 6 a.m. till 12 noon. Uh, you can listen live on the radio. It'll be on TV on Fox T- uh, 33. Uh, the web um, on our website and the app also. You can download the app. And listen, it's, uh, just search for WIBX 950 um, in Google Play and in the App Store.
And we are uh, sponsored by Charlie's Pizza in Washington Mills and North Utica. And they have a Charlie's Pizza catering special going on right now. Buy one full tray of anything. Get a second full tray of equal or lesser value, half price. That's an awesome deal. You could get, if you have a big party, you could buy 20 trays. Get 20 more trays for, uh, for, for half price. It's a great savings, and it's available out of their 3,000-foot, uh, square-foot uh, catering center in the Hannaford Plaza over in Washington Mills. It's uh, Charlie's Pizza. Also, Utica Pizza Company Express. That's where they have the uh, large and medium pizza wing special. And with that special, they give you, on top of the special, another cheese absolutely free. So it's a great deal. It is a great deal. And the food is even better than the deal, to be honest with you. But uh, so you just did this thing, twenty three and I keep wanting to say twenty three and me. Yeah, twenty three and cloudy, uh, Christmas Day today's is twelve eleven eighteen. Yeah. That was that was the forecast you got. Where'd you get that? National Weather, weather. Service. National Weather Service. Weather, National, National Weather Service. National yeah. Weather my phone. Service. I couldn't get sure? out that far on my phone. All right, National Weather. So that's what weather dot gov. Weather dot gov. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, so it's not the Weather Channel. It's yeah, this is the National, National Weather, weather Service. Service, which is where I think the Weather Channel gets it from. I don't think they program that far out. So what do you think the number one Christmas movie is um, in the world? Okay, it's going to be... Are we uh, talking about the Santa or the movie? Who voted on this? Was this an online vote? This is, this is, listen just to this specifically. The top ten Christmas movies. Movies, okay. okay well, but, number one is but, but it's who a determines? Life. I mean, who determines? Right. The These people. are people who have been polled. All right. They're well, probably the same people that are, I believe it's dentists. Uh, four out of five of them say that uh, this is the number one movie. <laughs> also, Floss. Um, yeah. I would say, like, anybody pre-20 or probably pre-25 isn't throwing It's a Wonderful Life on their top five, I don't think. Um, okay. You know what I'm saying? So that's why I think it matters who you ask. But do you want to know my favorite Christmas movie? I'd have to think about it for a while. It might even be. It might even be like one of these stupid claymation cartoons. I mean, I really love those and have great memories. Of well, because those as it's a, a wonderful life is my one of my, probably my favorite movie. Period. But you're a drama kid. You have so much drama. Yeah. No, it's just I you're mean, dramatic, it's a combination Andrew. of uh, of what it what Let the movie's me about those. and George Bailey, uh, okay, Jimmy you, Stewart. Uh, come on, Bill. I uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm out. Well, what do you want, Bill? I'm John, it's Jimmy Stewart. <laughs> uh, very good, very good. <laughs> Top ten Christmas movies uh, by these respondents. Okay. Number 10, The Holiday. Number 9, oh. Die Hard. Yes. Oh, the, the big get, debate. That's, oh, a, yeah. that's a Christmas movie. Oh, I'll get out no of doubt here. about Number it. Number 8, uh, one my wife watches over and over again every year, and we watched it. I think she was watching it just yesterday. National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. I knew you were yep. going to say that. Number 8. Surprise I knew eight. I liked Allison for a reason. Number, that's a great movie. Number 7, It's a Wonderful Life. Again, Number those two are too far down the list. I agree. Number 6, White Christmas. Number five, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. That's not a movie, though, is it? Well, there, there is, is a movie. Oh, now. it's the movie version. But the of Boris it. Karloff, so Boris Karloff, who did the original voice that was the TV of the Grinch, special. there was the TV special. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, number four, Love. Actually, what is that movie? Do we know? Uh, I've That's, heard. Of how it. is that a Christmas I've movie? It. It's a British number, mov- love movie. Number, well, things. I think this is a British poll, by the way. So that might change things. Number okay. three, A Christmas Carol. Number two, Home Alone two. Uh, okay, Home number are good. two though for Christmas uh, movies. One was two was better. the one in the city, I think. Yeah, and number was. one is. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I've got it here. And somewhere. number one is. Oh uh, wait a minute! I'm still looking for it. Hold on. And this number is... and and number one is. Should we? Uh, wait, we'll take a break, and I can find this. Go ahead. And number one <laughs> is Miracle on Thirty Fourth Street. Okay, that's a good. That's a very good. No, movie. it's not. No, no, because it's the 1994 version. Uh, it's the remake. Oh, yeah. It's the they say the and, and the original Miracle on Thirty Fourth isn't even on the list. That should be the one that's number one. I that, can't even believe it. Bill, that's what I'm saying. It depends on who you ask. You're right. These Brits they don't even brush their teeth. <laughs> oh, is that <laughs> true? <a> <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> once a week. Four out of five dentists polled in Britain said <laughs> we don't uh, we don't have any customers. Yeah, no. <laughs> All what right, dentists? and then and then briefly I'll give before we break I'll give you uh, the top ten movie Santas. Uh, Tim Allen's got to be on the list. Uh, top 10 movie Santas. Number 10, Jim Belushi, Jingle All the Way. Number 9, Edward Ivory, The Nightmare Before Christmas. Number 8, Billy Bob Thornton and Bad Santa. Number he 7, was good. Jim Broadbent and Arthur Christmas. I don't even know that yeah. one. 
Number six, Ken Hudson Campbell in Home Alone. Number five, David Huddleston in Santa Claus the Movie. Number four, Edward Asner in Elf. Elf, yes, okay, yeah. Elf, not Elf. The movie Elf, Elf was yeah. the... Ooh, ooh, yeah. <laughs> that was Elf. Uh, number three, Tim <laughs> Allen in The Santa Claus. That really was a good one. Which I never got until I was older that, that he was a lawyer in The Santa Claus, like it was the case. Number two, words. Tom Hanks in the motion picture, the motion capture, Polar Express. And number one, the number one, top number one movie Santa is the Santa from Miracle on 34th Street from 1994. Oh, no. You can tell it is. <laughs> it's terrible. You can tell it's British, too, because it uh, the picture capture, is that what it said? Uh, uh, oh, the picture motion ca- capture. The motion capture. It's the motion capture. Hey, it's not the motion picture. It's the That's motion capture. That's right. This is a British study. Anyway, Richard Attenborough did Miracle on 34th Street in 1984, the remake of that, and they say that is the number one. I think the number one Santa, period, bar none, has to be the original Santa Claus, whatever his name was, from Miracle on 34th, from 19-whatever it was. That was the best. Okay, hang on. Hang Here's on, the on. 1994 version, though. Here's some other. Hello, little one. How are you? Uh, Come. Well. Uh, she's deaf. You don't have to talk to her. She just wanted to see you. You are a very beautiful young yeah, well, that's because he, he's British. That's why. And that was, that's I believe, why they like him. Yeah. Edmund Gwen was the original. I yeah. believe so. That yes. was the original. To me, that was just. That's the beard, and she pulled mm-hmm. it, and he went, oh. Yeah. Yeah. Punched her. Remember Made that? the elf noise. Yeah. Talking about uh, teaching our kids how to drive, I'm going through that right now. And as my wife says, why in the world would we have you teach anyone how to drive? <laughs> <clears throat> Sheriff Mayshall, good morning. Good morning. I'd how hate are to you? be your kids, though. It's like... uh, yeah, you could ask them. They'll tell you some stories. Uh, but... I made it through two of them. The third right now, it's it's a, a bit of a struggle. Um, we, we, I've been teaching her at the farm on the side-by-side, and we, we almost uh, had a crash the other day. Mm. So it's, just, it's not clicking, you know, the gas and the brake. There's a is... clicking thing. And, yeah. um, you yeah. know, i got to tell you, I learned how to drive uh, – when I drove, my father's like, "You're, you can do what you want, uh, but there's a 1964 pickup truck out yeah. there. It's a five-speed, long stick on the floor. Yep, that's what I learned. Um, no power brakes, no power steering. Yep. You want to go to that uh, that dance? Have at it. <laughs> so I did. So Bill walked. Oh no, you, you know it had different it. color fenders and the whole nine yards. But I learned how to drive on a on a mini bike. It was a a little little motorcycle." You learn the the, the sure. concept of shifting, sure. And yeah. it, there's just something that clicks, and once it does, yep. you could do it on any, on any. That's I learned on a tractor. I was about twelve when I started working oh, for go. my uncle, and this yeah. thing was well, it was a massive to me. The back then it was massive, but um, so I always tell my kids, I've got more miles in reverse between being a cop for. 30 years, i got more miles in reverse than they'll ever have going forward. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. the, um, uh, but what? I've never, that's one thing I never learned to do was a, a manual transmission. I wish I had learned. Yeah, you still can, and you should. I think young. it's important to, to know. Well, except for, for the guy waiting, for except for the guy that's behind you when you're on a slight <laughs> incline at the light and you roll backwards. Oh, gosh, oh, gosh, oh, gosh. I worked in Little Falls, uh, uh, the radio station in Little, in Little Falls. <laughs> and let me tell you. When you'd be coming up, right, I'd coming up onto Main Street, and you'd be coming up from Ann Street or one of those that's on a hill. Yep. Yeah. And you'd have to stop, and there'd be cars behind you. One of the scariest things in the world. Yeah. Boy, let me tell you, you see the smoke coming oh, out of yeah. that transmission you've when you're done. You've got your foot sideways because you're holding the brake, yeah. but you're trying to give it some gas so it <laughs> yeah. doesn't stall while you're letting off the clutches. Mm-hmm. So you're doing three pedals with two feet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's uh, something. And, and uh, Sheriff, if we could, yes, sir. Uh, the thing that worries me most about my kids out there on the road driving now is the fact uh, that this holiday season seems to, I don't know whether it's we're, I don't know, traffic's heavier over in New Hartford, over by the, the shopping centers there or whatever. People have zero patience right now. Yeah, and, and, and now, you know, I lived there my whole life, right around the corner from there in, in New York Mills. And, and uh, since I've been gone for the past four years, whenever I go back, I'm like, how did I ever do this? Yeah. I mean, because I live... The only thing I drive, I was behind an Amish buggy on the, when I left my house today, so that's where, where I live now. But So I come down here, and it's, it's totally different. But you're right. There's no patience. Um, not only is the traffic crazy, um, the one thing that irritates me more than anything is when someone is approaching a light, and they're making a left, let's say, into Consumer Square, mm-hmm. and the light goes from green to yellow. But, no, we're going to keep creeping under the intersection. Yeah. And we've got the entire intersection blocked because mm-hmm. now the light is red. 
Those people can't pull in because everyone stopped. The cars going it's a mess. on commercial drive yeah. can't go because these people who were you know wouldn't wait trying back to by get the that. Left. Oh, I'll get correct. the last minute extra turn because you know you're gonna you're gonna wait another minute or Maybe. two minutes. So, yeah. You know, I, what, I, what I've started doing is driving down to Panera and going in there. It's oh, easier. Yeah. It's sure. much, easier much easier and easier. less congested. Yep. Oh, much easier. So if you see traffic, head down there. They used to not welcome that, but now they even. Kind of direct you if you keep going, you can take the right to go into the. You can go up to left, Walmart, but and back they down. encourage you to go yeah. that Walmart. Now, when they first opened, I don't know if you remember when Consumer Square first opened, there was no traffic lights inside the complex there. Right, and yeah. it was right before Christmas, the Christmas season, and I'll never forget. It was a nightmare. I felt so bad for Harford PD because they they actually had to hire cops to stand there and direct traffic. So they got lights up. You know, it was a few weeks because the, yeah, it was just yeah. incredible the congestion when you pulled into Consumer Square. There was no lights at all, and that place has gotten only yeah. more popular with more stores exactly. going in. I didn't think they could put any more physical buildings in that. I don't know where they're going to park over there. I really don't. I remember when that was a there was a trailer park up there and a lumber yard yeah. when I was a kid. Mini yeah. golf course you grew up right over there, right there. Yeah. yeah. What was right there, there just before? Was it just field? Just fields. And just uh, fields. Again, there was a trailer park, yeah. and uh, like I, I guess said, there was yeah. a lumber yard there. Like it was only Hartford Queen Diner, and then those businesses to the one side. Those that the development that's happened, it was, it's tremendous it's when you think about short over time, there. Short period. Of time. There was a movie incredible. theater. Remember the movie theater mm-hmm. right, right driving theater us. up the road. Yeah. yeah. So, but a lot of that was it just was indoor kind of, and outdoor. It was a move drive-in theater it was, up there and yep. an indoor one. It was really, uh, but now it has just transformed into yep. commerce. Holy cow! Yep. All right. So a lot of people come here. And they rent snowmobiles, or they bring them up from the south, and they snowmobile up north. Mm -hmm. Three horrible Mm -hmm. tragedies happened over the weekend. Yes, uh, extremely extremely tragic weekend. Um, You know, we did our press conference on Thursday. We do this every year. And a couple people asked me, why do you invite down Chief Ron Johnston? Because he's from the town of Webb, which is the Mm -hmm. northern part of Herkimer County. Not only am I good friends with with Ron, but... um, a lot of our people go up there because mm-hmm. they get snow before we do, and plus uh, a lot of people travel through our area going up there. So he comes down, and, and same thing. I mean, I shared some tips. He shared some tips. We had great media coverage. You guys are there. Um, and usually we're, we're pretty confident we'll have a fatal each season, <clears throat> but we didn't three imagine we'd have three a day Early. after we had our yeah. press conference yeah. telling people, you know, don't know. don't go fast. Watch the trail conditions. Trails are just opening. Most of them aren't mm-hmm. even open yet. Um, you know, the, 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 there's very little snow on the ground. It's all ice packed. So, again, try to stop a sled. And, and I talked about this that day. A lot of these sleds are coming out of the crates. They'll do 100 miles an hour like yeah. nothing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you go and, and these trails have curves. The trails obviously have turns and obstacles. You have to go through wooded areas. And, uh, I mean, again, it, it comes down to speed and, and icy trail conditions. Yeah. You know? And, and a lot just... of people, like uh, I call, a lot of my friends are sled heads. And, mm-hmm. I mean, they're like, it was still... 60 and they're revving oh, yeah. up there so yeah. a lot of that yep. is they want to get out there and stuff yep. like that but you know to talk about you know the fresh path as opposed to two or three months worth of snow well, you want you want just you want snow fall on the ground you've got to let the, tr- the the snowmobile clubs get out there they have huge grooming machines that do a fabulous job they're grooming these trails they're prepping the trails they're clearing the trails of debris None of that has happened yet because we, yeah, I mean, we've had yeah. snowfall, but we haven't had anything Not a lot. significant. And no. we've had days that were up uh, to 50 degrees. Exactly. So. And, I, and this weekend it's going to warm up again. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it, it's just it's, it's frustrating for us because, like I said, I, I, I'll be starting my ninth year as the sheriff, and we've yet to have a season where someone hasn't been killed on a snowmobile or someone hasn't been killed on a, on a boating accident or a drowning. And it's so frustrating for us because we stress, and you guys are great. We push the education. We push the, the safety tips. We're constantly, we're out there. We're patrolling. We're, we're doing, you know, uh, safety checks on us trails and again still it's just it, yeah. it still happens and it's so preventable uh when you say we haven't had a season where we wouldn't mm-hmm. we haven't had someone die in a boating accident or in a snowmobile Correct. accident is that just oneida county or is mm-hmm. that pretty upset? much yes really yes. we've had one yeah. at least one every year at least one county. county mm-hmm. yep and i mean I, I may be missing a year or two here but i'm pretty confident and uh when i say boating accidents i'm we've also I, I don't think we had any boating accidents this summer, but we had a drowning. So you know what I mean. Right. So I understand what you said. Yeah, is, you know, a death on the water. That is yeah. correct. Yeah, and and it's just it's tragic, you know. And I guess you know the the uh, when we when we have our meetings and we and we plan for these things, they say, well, if we weren't doing these safety things, the numbers would be probably much higher. Yeah. But I mean, we would love to make it through a season to you know without having any bad accidents or fatalities, and it's just it's frustrating. It, it truly is. So in these cases, um, all three were high rate of speed. I believe, uh, according to the chief. Two of the three, and I don't know the details on the third one, but uh, two of the three were icy trail conditions mixed with high speed on the snow. Yeah. And I just think a lot of people, too, they think, oh, I've, you know, and these 
all I mean, all three are young. 46, 28, or and, mm-hmm. and eighteen or twenty six and eighteen. But I feel like sometimes there's this element too of I've been I've been riding for five, six years. <laughs> I know how to ride, you know, I'm an expert and, and so they just kind of And again, get complacent. I mean some of these modern machines, you don't realize you're doing eighty miles right, an hour right. in and you know, like me, I mean the snowmobiles I grew up on, the the carburetors were right in front of you blowing yeah. gas on you and if you got these things to go thirty five, you were <clears throat> like yeah, the big yeah. guy on the block, yeah. you know. But they're they're not the same snowmobiles today and they're made for comfort, suspension, heated grips, heated seats. So my point is you don't realize if you're not real familiar with these machines, you don't realize you're doing eighty miles an hour and then oh my god, here comes the trail where it goes into the woods. I've got to stop. They can't stop. They they skid out, they yeah, get ejected yeah. from the snowmobile and thrown into a tree. I mean that that's how these things yeah. happen. It it just constantly happens time after time after time. And we can't stress enough for people to please you know, know your sled, know the conditions, and, and watch your speed. I mean, I, I just don't know the satisfaction you get out of going so fast. Yeah. I mean, when I'm out in the woods, I want to enjoy the outdoors. I, yeah. I really yeah. don't want to see it at, at 100 yeah. miles an hour. Uh, Rob saying um, on highways when when the roads are slippery and, and beyond drivable, we shut those roads down. Could the same thing happen on snowmobile trails? Uh, more than likely not, no. Yeah. Because, again, the groomers go out. They have a, a huge machines. They go out during the night. And, um, uh, no, I mean, people just really, like I said, look forward to it. Here in Oneida County alone, we when when, we're, when all trails are open, we have 650 miles of groomed snowmobile trails just in Oneida County. That's incredible. Yeah. You know? And, again, uh, one of the biggest issues we deal with is respect for the landowners because these are all on private lands. And we can't stress enough to the guys and, and families and people that are out on these trails, respect the landowners, stay on the trails. There's still farmers because the winter came so quick this year. Yeah, yeah. There's still farmers that have soybeans and corn out and they mm-hmm. have not yet been harvested. They'll be getting out there to, to harvest them. We've got people Ooh, that's riding. It's got to be through. tough in these conditions. Well, actually, the, you don't get stuck when everything's frozen. Right. So the mud <laughs> right. goes away. That's true, that's too. True. I guess. But um, people are going off the trail systems already. We're getting complaints. They're driving through soybean fields. I mean, we can't have that. Yeah, without yeah. the landowners, there's no trails. And, and this is a big uh, economic huge, boon for huge. the uh, Hotels, fuel, for the area. food. Drinks yeah. huge. We realize yeah. that, but we got to balance it with following the laws, rules, and, and respecting the landowners. All right, Sheriff. Is there uh, do you have stuff on your website where people can go to? Because parents, which should really be like okay. easiest thing for everyone to do now, because we're actually going through an upgrade with our website. Right. Yes, you can go to our website, but a website. But if you have uh, an iPhone, just download our free app, the United County Sheriff's Office. There are tips. There's news releases. We send out alerts every single day, multiple times a day on there. So it's a free app, United County Sheriff's. Download it, and uh, and we'll keep you in the loop on everything. All right, fair enough. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you.